I defer to you. Alrighty. Um, okay. So one more time, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, my name is Zach Holmes, and I'm just going to briefly go over a few announcements um, on behalf of Alachua Audubon Society. And then I will hand it over to Rex to do introductions of our um, amazing presenter tonight. So thank you all again um, for joining us. Uh, this presentation is going to be recorded. So if you and posted to our YouTube channel and our website and our social media. So if you um, want to pass it on to anybody or uh, talk about it to someone who didn't get a chance to be here tonight, uh, definitely let them know about that. Uh, as is um, appropriate, seeing how we're talking about Christmas bird counts and it's the Christmas bird count season, I did want to announce that we have five regional Christmas bird counts, uh, which you will learn all about today and uh, in the area. So just briefly, if you have your calendars, uh, we have five coming up. Uh, the Melrose Christmas bird count is on December 15th. The Gainesville Christmas bird count is on December 18th. Itchituckney is on December 20th. Lake City is on December 29th. And Cedar Key is on January 4th. If you have any questions about those, feel free to send anyone at Alachua Audubon an email and we can give you that information. Also, uh, we have our next round of internship opportunities coming up for graduate students starting in the spring. And if you have or know any uh, graduate student, I'm sorry, undergraduate students who are interested um, in interning with us and learning a bunch of different um, volunteer and conservation-based opportunities, please uh, let them know that opportunity is coming up. Um, other than that, I don't have any other announcements. I will lend it over to Rex, who will be able to provide our intro. Thanks so much, guys, and enjoy. Thank you, Zach, and good evening, everyone. Uh, the name Frank Chapman meant nothing to me uh, when I started out as a teenage birder. Uh, even 20 years later, trying to make a place for myself in the Gainesville birding scene, I, I still knew him only as the, uh, only vaguely, as the author of an obsolete handbook of birds of Eastern North America. He uh, just belonged to a past age, so I saw no reason to learn anything about him. Um, Alachua Audubon used to sponsor the printing of, of uh, checklists like this one, entitled Birds of the Gainesville Region, Florida. Uh, they listed all of the bird species recorded here, how common they were and at what times of year you might expect to see them. Uh, I was preparing a new edition of the checklist in 1996 when uh, Tom Weber, a collections manager at the museum, told me about this book, Frank M. Chapman in Florida, his journals and letters. At that point, everything changed because I learned that Chapman had spent the winter of 1886-87 in Gainesville and afterward had published a paper on the bird life of Alachua County in the AUK, the Journal of the American Ornithological Society. And that was the first time anyone had uh, surveyed the bird life of the county. Uh, following up, I learned that Chapman had originated the Christmas bird counts that I'd been participating in since 1974 as well as a magazine called Bird Lore, which I'd been receiving for years under its current name, Audubon. And that in his capacity as curator of birds at the American Museum of Natural History in New York, he had been a pioneer in neotropical ornithology. That is quite a legacy for a man who was born 10 months before the end of the Civil War and died three months after the end of World War II quite a legacy that extends into the modern age. Uh, so obviously I, I was wrong. He does not just belong to a past age. He belongs to our modern age as well. Uh, so anyways, moving ahead to March, 2018, uh, a guy named Jim Huffstadt contacted me. He told me that he was writing a book about Frank Chapman and he wondered if I could show him the places that Chapman had visited 131 years previously. 
I was delighted to do it. And Jim and I spent a great morning looking at Payne's Prairie, Newton's Lake, Sugarfoot Prairie, and the Gainesville neighborhood near the Thomas Center where Chapman's mother lived in the 1880s and 1890s. As for Jim himself, uh, he was born in Illinois along the Illinois River. He's a self-described river rat. Uh, there were four state parks along that stretch of the river, which he and his family frequently visited. So he grew up with an appreciation for nature. In 1978, he went to work for the Illinois Department of Conservation, but he left in 1985 to go to work for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission as an information and education specialist in West Palm Beach. Uh, he stayed down there until 1985 when he retired to Tallahassee. So um, when I first heard about Jim's projected book, I was pretty excited and having read it now, I'm still excited. Uh, so now I'm gonna introduce Jim and let him take over. We're gonna ask that you save your questions for the end. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, thank you, uh, Rex, and, and thanks to Zach and everybody that's made this possible. And I just briefly wanna mention uh, Rex is uh, quite a fine gentleman. And uh, the day he took me on that guided tour, walking in Frank Chapman's footsteps at Payne's Prairie was memorable and meaningful. And uh, I will always remember it. And uh, I could not, could not uh, imagine a better companion and guide uh, than Rex. And I want to thank him for that. Uh, he's a remarkable guy. And uh, I'm glad he's here because he knows as much as I do about Frank Chapman, I think, maybe more. So uh, I hope he keeps me honest here and won't let me get away with every, anything. Uh, I, uh, I guess uh, let's start with why. why. Why did I become so obsessed with this man that I spent uh, uh, more than... Uh, 20 years, really, uh, if, you, if you look at it that way. And uh, it, it started with this book. And I'm going to hold it up. You'll see it in the slides later, but I want to just to show it to you here. There we go. Camps and Cruises of an Ornithologist. Beautiful book. And I found this in a Fort Lauderdale used bookstore. And uh, I opened the pages and I fell into a wonderful world of birds as described by Frank Chapman, who was the most popular bird writer of his generation. Now, I believe all of us are aware that he was the creator. He conceived the Christmas bird count. And I'm not gonna go into a great deal about that. But uh, first of all, uh, our initial slides show him as a young man. And he was born in New Jersey, not far from Hackensack, New Jersey, uh, very near the, uh, the Palisades, the, the cliffs that uh, front the Hudson River. And uh, he grew up in a, a beautiful place there uh, that he was bound to be a bird lover. Uh, one of the visitors to their estate, uh, they, lived, they had about 45 acres, it was uh, his grandfather kept it in uh, uh, pear trees, apple trees, plum, uh, that sort of thing. The area, it already was a, uh, a, a point of bedroom community for New York City. Uh, his father was a banker, lawyer, Civil War veteran, uh, and they were definitely upper class. They, they lived in a beautiful home. And birds were always part of his life. In fact, a visitor to his home once said that this was a, a place that seemed to be designed for birds and for those that loved them. And uh, he often said that he grew up with the birds. They were like his brothers and sisters. He loved nature. And he loved roaming the woods and the, the areas around. There was a, it, it was a patchwork, a quilt, of small farms. Of course, this was 
1864, there, when he was born, and as a boy in the 1870s, and young man in the 1880s and 90s, it was a different place. There was, uh, there were no cars. Uh, they did have the railroad, uh, but it was very pristine and uh, rich, rich in, in terms of birds. They were all around him. And he said in his memoirs, published in the early 30s, that uh, he knew the songs of the birds long before he knew their names. And uh, he, he just loved those woods there. He was one of two children. He had an older sister. He spent a lot of time by himself in the woods or walking with his father, who was a was a, an amateur naturalist, uh, and a hunter, but he was uh, an educated hunter who, who knew, uh, knew the birds, knew the wildlife, and uh, conveyed his knowledge and his love to, to his son. And uh, if we could move on to the next slide here. Ah, here we go. Uh, the area where he grew up now has changed considerably, but uh, there is uh, still some wonderful bird country there. And the, the uh, Bergen County, Bergen County, New Jersey Audubon Society dedicated a park and trail to Chapman, which goes through some of the same areas that he, as a boy and a young man, so loved. And uh, this is uh, one of their trail markers. I think it's the initial one. And you can see the picture to the left is uh, Frank Chapman as an older man. I would say it was taken uh, in the late 30s or maybe even the early 40s. Uh, he died in 1945. He's 81 years old. And below him, you can see one of the books he wrote, What Bird Is That?, which was popular in its day. It's dated, of course. And then you can see. Uh, to the far left corner there, uh, the cover of Bird Lore, which was the first popular bird magazine published in the United States. And uh, he was the owner, publisher, editor of that. When, uh, when it came about, uh, he would put it together on weekends with his wife, Fanny. His uh, wife, he called his best assistant. And uh, she lived for her husband and for his for his uh, love of birds. And she accompanied him uh, on many, many expeditions from the uh, frigid uh, Canadian St. Lawrence to all the way to the tip of South America. And they had some adventures and I'll explain a little bit. And then in the right corner, you see a beautiful painting. I, I'm not sure who painted that, but it's of a peregrine falcon uh, along the Palisades, which was only a few miles walk from his home. And as he got older, he spent a lot of time at the Palisades. And of course, the uh, peregrine, as we know, is a fantastic creature uh, that in a dive can hit up to 200 miles an hour. Uh, he knew it as uh, the duck hawk in those days because they fed on the ducks uh, quite frequently. But uh, there you see, he taught men to know birds, children to love them. And uh, that says a lot about him. He was many things. And my goal was people know, most people, most bird lovers know about the Christmas bird count and know about his role. And that was a tremendous uh, contribution that links him with today. Uh, just briefly, you know, he began that in 1900, he had 27 participants. I think they uh, identified 90 different species. Uh, most recently, these are rough numbers, but you're talking about uh, upwards of 70,000 volunteer census takers in the United States, Canada, Mexico, parts of South America and the Pacific Islands, uh, counting literally millions of birds, and I believe six or 700 different species. And the value of that census has appreciated from 1900 to today because as it has grown in popularity, it's a wonderful database. And uh, I think, I don't want to go into a lot of detail, but uh, in layman's terms, and I am a layman, you know, it gives you population trends, it shows uh, the changing migration routes, uh, and uh, 
other facts and you can compare data from year to year and see changes. It's kind of like an ecological radar. Uh, and the experts today use this, uh, this data, this valuable data uh, in so many different ways. But let's move on to the, to the, next, uh, the next slide. Zach, are we, are we moving? There we go. Now this is uh, young Chapman. Uh, by this time, this was, I believe in 1890, he would have been in his late twenties. This is his office in the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, right by Central Park. And uh, when he joined, there was only one other member, paid member of the staff, that was uh, Dr. Joel Elsif Allen, who was a great pioneer. And we'll, we'll explore how that all came to be. But uh, that roll top desk uh, was his desk for the next 54 years. And he uh, worked alongside Dr. Allen, who became a, not only a mentor, a teacher, but uh, a father figure to him. Uh, his personal life, uh, Frank was very close to his father, who was a banker and attorney who worked for a Wall Street bank. They were, they were well to do. You know, unfortunately, uh, at age 11, Frank lost his father. And that was in 1876. Uh, the same year, their, their home burned uh, near Teaneck, uh, New Jersey, which is near Hackensack, burned to the ground. And uh, he and his mother moved to Baltimore to live with his older sister. It was a miserable experience because it was in the city and he missed his friends, not only his human friends, but he, he missed the birds. He, he, he missed the, the woods. He missed the river. And finally, uh, they were there, I don't think, more than a year. And he talked his mother into letting him go home and live with a neighbor who had a son his age. So he went back before mom did because she was having a new home built. But uh, very close ties to his mother, who was artistic, and also highly musical, a gifted pianist. And Frank was born with perfect pitch. And although he was never pursued uh, the piano or any instrument, he tried the drums for a while and then gave up. But he, like most proficient birders, saw with his ears. Uh, and he was excellent at that. He was also a born mimic. And in years later, uh, people who worked at the museum would comment how he and another good friend and uh, employee, uh, one of the scientists there at lunch hour, would have these battles. They would uh, mimic a bird, and then the other one would try to guess what, what species it was. And uh, they had a good time at lunch. I'm not sure if, <laughs> if some other people at lunch appreciated it, but, but they had a good time. So, Zach, if you will. Moving right along. And here's the gentleman I mentioned, uh, uh, Dr. Allen. And he was an interesting fellow. He had many skills. Uh, he, was, he was educated in zoology. Uh, he came to the museum as its first paid employee. Not, I mean, had employees, but I mean, as far as a, as a naturalist, that was a word they used back then quite frequently. And he was a one-man show for a couple of years till he hired uh, Chapman for, for the, uh, the grand sum of $50 a month, which wasn't bad back then. And uh, the, he was uh, just uh, such a kind man. And at that time, young Chapman suffered from a respiratory illness. It was quite serious. And it was frustrating to me because in the research that I did over the years, they referred to this only in vague terms. I don't know what it was, but it was clear that he grew out of it as he became older. My guess, and it's strictly a guess, this was when TB was uh, uh, really a terrible, terrible presence throughout the country. Every county had a TB clinic and, and, and a lot of people died. And uh, I think those of us here probably could talk about that. I lost an uncle and an aunt that I never knew to tuberculosis. But uh, 
he apparently it apparently healed. You you don't always die from TB. Sometimes it heals, the scar heals, and you can go on. But uh, Alan was very cognizant of that, and when he did decide to hire Chapman, uh, they made an arrangement. Chapman by then was uh, living in winters at his in the Gainesville area at his mother's uh, winter cottage. They called it Cozy Cottage or Cozy Corner Cottage. I believe they had two, but that was the nickname of, of, of perhaps both. I, I'm not sure. But uh, because of his health, uh, they made an arrangement that he would spend winters in Florida or on uh, field trips in other normally uh, warmer climates, which was quite a deal uh, for, for Chapman. And uh, this man, uh, they worked together, that their desks were very close together for more than 40 years. He admired this fellow who was a born teacher because he had quite, an, quite, quite a background himself. He had explored the Amazon River in Brazil right after the Civil War in 1867. And uh, that was uh, quite a task in those days. I mean, uh, the tropical diseases were rampant and uh, it still was the white man's graveyard in many cases. Uh, and he would tell Chapman about his adventures. He also uh, was a naturalist along with General Custer in 1874 on a major expedition into the Black Hills, the sacred Black Hills of the Sioux Nation, which two years later led to the Sioux War and led to the defeat of Custer and the death of, of the general and uh, 265 uh, troopers on, on the Little Bighorn River. So uh, the 1874 expedition was quite exciting, and uh, uh, Joe would talk to him about that and about Custer and uh, how they would uh, encircle the wagons and uh, the infantry soldiers would put their rifles over the wagons while the Indians would ride around uh, at a distance. So, uh, you know, he, he met so many fascinating people, and certainly Dr. Allen was one of them. So. Next slide, please. Ah, Alachua Sink, Gainesville, Florida. As I mentioned, his mother had a, a winter cottage there. And uh, he uh, spent, he and his mother spent, uh, in fact, she became a, a, a year round resident at some point. But he usually spent uh, part or all of his winters in in Gainesville and used that as his base to explore Florida. Florida was, was one, uh, an area which was, uh, which was a real joy uh, as it is to most bird lovers because of our wonderful wading birds and, uh, and just the, uh, the rich treasury of, of nature that Florida was more so in those days. And of course, it is a sink, the water was high when this picture was taken, and that was true in the early years when he was there. They actually had uh, uh, steamboats with minimal draft that would go across the lake. And uh, he wrote beautifully about his experiences on the lake. And uh, of course, in those days, he rode a pony and would go out and uh, he dealt with a, with a gentleman of little education who showed him the ropes, but he, he couldn't read a book, but he could read nature, this man was. And to, to Chapman's credit, he was very progressive in several ways. He did not dismiss people, uh, crackers, as they were called in Florida, that were rough around the edges, if they knew nature, and many did. They might not know the Latin names, but they knew the birds, they knew the, the deer, they knew so much. And uh, Chapman was, was very good about crediting them. And uh, one of those gentlemen uh, he met down here. Uh, by the way, he also, in the Gainesville area, ran across a shot out rookery, a waiting book, word rookery. And this leads to one of his great campaigns. He wasn't the only one, but he was a key leader in the fight against the plume hunters. And I think most of us know what that was about. 
and uh, in a future slide, I'll, I'll, I'll go more into that. But uh, let's move on. One more, Zach. And I'm concentrating on Florida right now, since most of us, I think, are Floridians. And uh, this was a camp at Taylor Creek, which is just north of Lake Okeechobee. And you can see the laundry is out. And under that tent to the right, uh, that is Chapman, at least according to the American Museum of Natural History uh, librarian, that was young Chapman. And uh, that was 1895. We know how beautiful the wilderness areas are today. Well, we can only imagine what he saw in that day and age. Now, he was following in his father's footsteps. He graduated from high school at age 17 and originally went to work at a bank. And I'm not sure if it was the same bank his father worked on, but it may have been, it was downtown New York. And uh, really at that time, uh, he had an opportunity to go to college. He was a, a good baseball player. He also was an excellent uh, dash man on the track team. And uh, his, uh, his coach wanted him to apply for college and, and join the track team. But Frank said, you know, school, nobody ever talked about what he was interested in uh, because they didn't talk about conservation or, or nature or birds. And uh, he knew there were people that uh, spent their lives doing it. But in that age, and, and these are estimates, I doubt if anybody really knows, but there may have only been a dozen or two dozen people in the United States that were actually paid to be a naturalist. Uh, uh, colleges didn't even offer an ornithology course. You could get a degree in zoology. It was just unheard of. It was a hobby for many, and it was a avocation for, for the rich, the wealthy gentlemen naturalists. And they did good work. They, they did wonderful things. But uh, although uh, Chapman was certainly well off, he was not, uh, he was not fabulously wealthy. He couldn't just uh, turn, turn away and forget about making his living. So he, he worked at the bank for nine years and he said that he enjoyed it and he did well. Uh, but he had met several people on the train commuting to and from New York. One, both were great naturalists and he pursued it as a hobby. And one of them, by the way, had been to Brazil. And when he came back, uh, Chapman visited him in his apartment and was surrounded by all these mounted species that he had collected. Uh, and Chapman in the back of his mind thought, why can't I, I, I do this? Well, this is my passion. This is my love. And uh, finally, he, uh, he determined to leave uh, the banking world uh, to the utter amazement of his colleagues because they said, what are you doing? And he was essentially a freelance naturalist. He did a lot of work in, uh, in Florida, uh, but let's, let's move on and we'll go more into that. Here's, a, here's a, an island. This is the Cuthbert Rookery in the Everglades. And as I mentioned, he, uh, Chapman was a leader uh, in trying to fight the, the devastation of the plume hunters. Uh, ladies, not only in the United States, but in England and Europe and South America, you, if you dressed, you had to have uh, bird feathers or plumes, or maybe a wing or two, or maybe an entire carcass nest, nesting in your huge hat. That was the style. And uh, millions of birds were being killed. Uh, Cuthbert Rookery for a while was a secret haven for the plume hunters who would go in and they preferred to go in during breeding season. And they concentrated on those beautiful wading birds. The uh, roseate spoonbill was a target, uh, favorite target, the great egret, snowy, we egret uh, and others, although the demand for these feathers was such that uh, in time uh, they would settle for any bird. They liked those breeding, bird, uh, breeding plumes from the wading birds because the colors were so vibrant. In fact, they, they paid more than twice the value of gold 
you know, 32 ounces of bird feathers was worth twice what 32 ounces of gold was right about the turn of the century. And these were poor men uh, down in, the, in Florida, the crackers, and uh, they didn't know any better. And of course, this was the frontier uh, uh, times and the frontier ethic was still there. And they had this uh, feeling that our natural resources were inexhaustible. Well, they weren't. And uh, when Chapman was a young uh, ornithologist or naturalist is what he's called, uh, he and others were very, very uh, pessimistic about the future of these birds. And to give you an idea, he came to Florida in 1886, 1885, many, many expeditions across the state. It wasn't until he came to the Cuthbert Rookery in 1909, 21 years later, after all those expeditions, that's where he saw his first roseate spoonbill because they were so rare. They were being shot out of existence. Uh, these are not roseate spoonbills. I believe those are uh, iron, what they called iron heads. And uh, for the life of me, I can't remember the, the name of the species, the terrible odd looking bird. Uh, corkscrew swamp is full of them. Uh, my my memory is gone right now, but uh, but let's move on. Woodstore, Woodstore. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and uh, but uh, but these are wood storks in this picture, I believe. But let's move on, Zach. Ah, here we go. William Brewster. We talked about the wealthy naturalists, the gentleman naturalists. William Brewster was a great pioneer. And he lived in Cambridge near Harvard. Uh, he uh, basically managed the, uh, the collection, the bird collection at Harvard for many years until his death in 1919. He was a giant and uh, he was there at the creation. He was a member of the Nuttall Bird Club and later uh, was one of the founders of the AOU, American Ornithological. Union, and uh, he, he just was one of the pillars of uh, those early days. Uh, he had a, a presence, they called, uh, they said he, when he presided over meetings, he was like the Sultan. He was very tall with a thick beard and a low voice, and he didn't, uh, didn't tolerate fools. And uh, anyway, when Chapman was a young man, he went to a AOU meeting and he met all his heroes and William Brewster was one of them. And I found it interesting uh, reading a letter by Chapman as a young man to Brewster, which he, he had heard, but he had not been introduced. And uh, it was a request for his photograph uh, with an autograph. It reminded me of a young baseball fan, you know, wanting a picture of uh, Roger Maris, Mickey Mantle. Uh, but they developed a, a wonderful close relationship. And uh, let's move the slide here. We'll explore that just a little bit. Oh, Florida. Well, I'm going to just finish up the relationship with, with Brewster. But they, they eventually, in 1991, they uh, rented a uh, flat boat uh, scow uh, on uh, the, the Swanee and they uh, spent two weeks floating down the river and they had a couple of canoes tied in the back and it was a, a, a wonderful wonderful journey for them and they became quite close and in fact reading the correspondence and by the way Harvard uh, Harvard's Museum of Comparative Zoology MCZ which is the modern day uh, equivalent of what Brewster began so many years ago. They recently digitalized uh, the correspondence between Chapman and Brewster, and it includes about a thousand letters. Uh, you can access that on, online. I've read many of the letters, especially Chapman's letters, but certainly not all of them. But it was so revealing. And when you do a biography, you want to in an ideal sense, a biographer wants to bring them back from the grave, and show you what 
they really were like. And, uh, those letters were so revealing because these men who were both very much Victorian gentlemen, very reserved, polite to the extreme, but uh, hard to get to know. But in those letters, you realize that when they, they put their guard down, they were extremely sensitive men, uh, very well read. Uh, they both were great admirers of the philosopher Henry David Thoreau. In fact, uh, Chapman went up to Thoreau's little cabin on the on Walden Pond, took some photos, which he shared with Brewster. But when they went down the Suwannee River, and in fact, uh, let me see here. I think I had a. You'll just bear with me here. I thought I had this all organized. Well, so much for organization. But uh, the Suwannee River, here I'm quoting from my book. They got down near the uh, near the Gulf on the Suwannee. And uh, they would often take their canoes up these little tributaries, these little creeks, rivulets, and slide in into the, to the interior and see these wonderful birds. He called it penetrating the heart of nature. And here's what Chapman wrote about that, Frank Chapman. Paddling silently through these shaded aisles, we felt in perfect harmony with our surroundings. Alligators, unalarmed by our noiseless approach, slid clumsily into the water almost at our bows. Rows of turtles tumbled off their favorite, favorite logs with a splash. A snake glided from the bank. When bushes hung low over the stream, Prothonatory warblers could be seen, their yellow heads gleaming like gold among the foliage. And this was perhaps his greatest legacy, is his ability to write. And when you read Chapman, and I've read almost all of his works, at least uh, parts of them, and uh, you open those pages and the, the birds uh, just... Uh, fly into your imagination. Uh, he was just so, so good. Now, going back to Florida, this was taken at the Indian River Lagoon near Miko, and it was the Oak Lodge. If you see there among the people to the very far right, there's a lady, a thin lady in a light colored dress, and her name was Ma Latham. And uh, she ran a boarding house there and entertained uh, the the creme de la creme of America's pioneer naturalists, and uh, Chapman was one of them. And uh, the Indian River Lagoon was a paradise. And uh, he loved that place. Interestingly enough, when he married, he married late in life because he once said that if you're a bird man and you take a wife, uh, you know, you're a bigamist because you're going to leave your wife for the birds instead of another woman. And, uh, but he, he met a divorced woman with four children and uh, her name was Fanny Embry. She was a city girl, much as I could find out. And uh, the test was their honeymoon. It was a working honeymoon to the Indian River Lagoon and they stayed here uh, at this place. And uh, she was game and wanted to be part of his life and understood it and knew that she would have to be. Uh, but she was afraid of snakes at that time, and he assured her they would not see any snakes. And <laughs> the first day, she saw something like a dozen and uh, wrote a, a letter to her son, who was in college at that time, and he thought the marriage was over before it started. And he came down and was surprised that she'd gotten over her fear. And uh, she... Uh, she helped him. Uh, they would take species, they would collect birds, and you had, you had to create a bird skin. And this was quite a bloody operation. 
And uh, she was taught by her husband, and he was just thrilled that she was so adept at it. And she was right there, right by his side. And that followed throughout their marriage. Now, I had mentioned Pelican Island, and most of us, I think, are aware that Pelican Island was the first national bird refuge in 1903, designated by Theodore Roosevelt, our conservation president. Well, uh, Chapman uh, had spoken to Roosevelt. They knew each other before that. They had worked together from, oh, I would say the time that uh, Roosevelt was governor of New York in about 1899, 1900, after he charged up San Juan Hill. But what people don't know about uh, Teddy is he was a bird lover. Well, Pelican Island, one evening here, Ma Latham was telling them about this little island and uh, called Pelican Island, and it was a rookery for pelicans. And uh, she said, if you want to see these birds, it's a brown pelican. And at that time, there was only one uh, rookery breeding area for the brown pelican in eastern Florida. Uh, they were being devastated. Uh, sometimes plume hunters would kill them. Sometimes tourists would, would shoot them, just, just shoot them for fun. And uh, anyway, uh, Fanny, uh, Chapman's wife, was listening, and she said to her husband, Frank, why don't we go look at this island? And uh, that was the beginning. And he returned again and again to Pelican Island and eventually led to conversations with uh, Teddy Roosevelt in the White House and Teddy designated the first of the federal uh, refuges of which we have more than 500 today. Uh, again, people know him, uh, know Chapman as the founder of the Christmas Bird Count. Few know of his uh, great role in uh, making Pelican Island a uh, protected refuge for the birds. So let's move along here. Ah, yes, get into the field. Brewster and Allen, the others that knew him as a young man, there you can see he was starting to bald, but he was still a young fellow. He probably was about 30. And his first major field expedition outside of Florida was uh, near Corpus Christi, rattlesnake country. And uh, it was quite, a, <laughs> quite an adventure. He uh, ended up living with a cracker family in a little cabin. They had seven children, ranging in age from a few years old to a teenager. And the roof leaked and it was full, of, the cabin was full of fleas. Chapman uh, recalls how the wind was constantly howling <coughs> and it kept him inside the cabin with all those kids. And also they had a few other visitors <laughs> that were there. It was two rooms. And at one time, I think they had, uh, besides the family, they had three or four other people. So you had a dozen people living in this cabin with the wind howling outside, the fleas biting you, and the rain uh, coming down through the roof. Uh, Chapman in his memoirs recalls that uh, he was sound asleep and suddenly he was awakened. There was a, a major leak and his uh, stomach was uh, wet. And uh, he reached over and found a pan. And he spent the rest of the night with his pan on his stomach and slept while it came down. But he discovered so many new birds there. It was the first time he saw the crested caracara. And as you know, it's a member of the vulture family, but it's a handsome bird. Maybe a vulture, but it's a handsome vulture. And he exulted in seeing those. He saw his first road runners and uh, the scissor tailed, uh, what is it? The scissor tailed, again, uh, Ron, can you help me? What am I? Flycatcher. Flycatcher, thank you. So that was, that was wonderful. Uh, and then they went up along the river, the new, I think it's pronounced Nuisis, N-U-E-C-E-S River. And uh, they had a Conestoga wagon and horses. And, and he and this, uh, the man who owned that little cabin went up the, went up the river. And uh, they were caught in a storm, a tornado out there on the prairie. 
and uh, they survived it. Uh, the other thing was the chaparral. Uh, I had heard the word chaparral, I never understood it, but it's a vegetation that's very thick. It's almost like barbed wire. And uh, it seemed like the birds you wanted to see were always surrounded by these, uh, like a concertina wire uh, consisting of chaparral. The other thing he remembered were the rattlesnakes were everywhere and quite large. And he wasn't real keen on that. So often it was a case of getting tangled in the chaparral while you heard a rattler in the distance. <laughs> so, yeah. so between the rattlers and the fleas and the tornado, it was quite an experience. But he was undaunted. He said it was joyful. And he was eager to go again. He loved those birds. And here you could see him next to his tent. And uh, I'm not sure what's hanging there. Uh, what do you think? Uh, maybe a wild turkey? Uh, maybe a turkey. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But, uh, you know, it's interesting. A good friend of mine, uh, his name is Larry here in Tallahassee, and he read my biography and enjoyed it. But about halfway through, he told me, he says, Jim, he said, I thought this was about a man who loved birds. He says he's shooting them left and right. <laughs> What's going on with that? And I explained to him that uh, when he began, that was the age of shotgun ornithology. And there were good reasons. Uh, because uh, the, uh, the cameras were very primitive and large, and very difficult to take a good picture of the bird. Uh, you had those glass plates. Uh, they, had, they made efforts to do it, but I mean, it wasn't, wasn't too successful. And of course, uh, the binoculars, the optics weren't as advanced. And if you really wanted to study a bird, you had to have it in hand. Now, that doesn't mean that it, uh, there weren't, uh, that doesn't mean that they needed to kill all the birds they did. And that was a dark secret of uh, the scientific community. And again, going back to Brewster and Chapman in their correspondence as early as the 1890s, they confided in one another their disgust with this miserable collecting. And they admitted that uh, it was being overdone, that the museums, the zoos, uh, they didn't need as many birds, uh, mounted birds as they were collecting. And then if you think here, you had the bird protectors killing all these birds, and then you had the plume hunters killing birds. Then you had the market hunters slaughtering birds. You know, you could go into a New York restaurant in the 1880s and order all kinds of birds that are protected today. And waterfowl, I mean, the Chesapeake Bay area, they hunted waterfowl there with essentially cannons uh, that were eight and nine feet long. They were called punt guns or punt boats. And uh, it was like a one gauge shotgun. And they would load those and they literally would kill 500, 700 ducks with one blast. All of these things were going on. And with Chapman is he changed as the times changed. And of course, as the uh, technical advances were, were moving along with better cameras, easier to use, he was on top of that. So. In his 54 career, 54 year career, <coughs> he was a leader in moving away from shotgun ornithology <coughs> to more what we understand today, but where you use cameras and you use not only cameras, but he pioneered the use of moving picture cameras <coughs> as early as 1908 and 1909. <coughs> Cuthbert Rookery was the place that he did that. He built a, uh, like a tree house in there and mounted his camera, and took some wonderful pictures. And he later showed it to Theodore Roosevelt's White House. But let's move along here. I guess I'm looking at the clock here. We, we've probably already hit 45 minutes, haven't we? Is anybody out there? Is everybody asleep? <laughs> I know you're good. Sorry, I had to find out how to unmute myself while I was sharing my screen. Um, <laughs> well, 
uh, let's see, we started at seven, so we've gone about 45 minutes. Let's Indeed. Um, if you want, we can just go through these these photos and you can describe them and then we can have a few minutes for questions if you'd like. I think so. So let's just move right along and uh, I'll, I'll keep my, the asides uh, brief. Uh, okay, yeah. sounds good. So this is, this is uh, Havana Harbor. It was his first look at uh, the, uh, the tropics and uh, it was a great adventure. Uh, he loved the, uh, the Trogans, uh, the Cuban Trogan was it. I think they call it the Coro down there, I believe. And it's red, white, and blue. And trogons are many species of trogons, and they were among his favorites. This was Savannah Harbor. That was about 1896, about two years before the Spanish-American War. And uh, his mother did not want him to go. And he, uh, in the correspondence that I, I read, uh, he was fighting a continual battle with her because Again, the tropical diseases, the, uh, the fevers, the cholera, the typhoid, uh, you know, they were dangerous places. And finally, she, she said, well, it's your passion, you follow it. And, uh, and that was his introduction to the tropics and uh, played a big role in his career. So let's go to the next one. There again, we were in Cuba. And that's what they called the Volan Cochi. And he, he traveled in that and he described it as a rolling torture chamber. Of course, the roads were rutted and primitive. And he goes in his writing, he describes uh, journeying uh, in this contraption. And he, it just sounds hideous. Okay, next one. There again, we're back to the feather fashions. And there's one of the women. I just briefly want to tell you that. Uh, Chapman went about deliberately to reach out to women. And at that time, many women were involved in women's clubs. They were active in politics, even though they didn't have the vote. Uh, many of them were educated. And uh, they turned out to be his greatest allies. Uh, and uh, he found that if he talked to them and talked to them about the repercussions of wearing these birds, they were just unaware. They had no idea that this fashion was condemning millions of birds to death. And, uh, you know, that was a long battle. That was probably the first great conservation battle in the United States, and it extended for 20, 30 years. And uh, Chapman was among the leaders, but he was ably assisted by many American women. And, uh, we'll move right along. We could write a book about, and there have been books written about it. He was a pioneer photographer. He wrote this. Uh, this may have been the first, certainly was the first really high profile book about how using your camera to study birds. And as I said, this shows his progression. He was a leader in the movement to go get away from that shotgun, to leave it at home and use a camera. And this book, uh, I, I've read great parts of it. Now, a lot of it's technical, and of course, it's all outdated, but he digresses at many points and describes, uh, you know, f f the birds he's photographing, and it's really a great read. Uh, moving along here. He wrote 17 books, by the way. Here again, 1901. Here's Chapman, and you can see He's got a shutter release cord. He fashioned it out of a bicycle pump, I think. And there's an osprey on the nest. Well, you know, we, our, our reaction might be, well, shutter release cord, big deal. Well, back then it was state of the art, you know, and he did a lot of things. He invented and marketed what he called uh, the Chapman umbrella blind, folding umbrella blind, which, uh, which was at the time, Pretty uh, remarkable. Okay, next one. There he is. Uh, by this time, this is the 1930s in Panama. He spent, uh, oh, from 1924 to about 1938, he spent most of his winters in Panama at the Tropical Research Institute and did some, some great work on uh, various uh, birds, mannequins, oropandolas, and uh, did some wonderful writing. He wrote two books based on his experiences there. 
He called it my tropical air castle. Very readable today. I recommend it. Next slide, please. Uh, he also, remember, he started out as a naturalist, but he, he, uh, he always was primarily focused on birds. But when he got to Panama, this uh, research institute was on a, an island in Aparo, Colorado. And, uh, but it had a little bit of everything. Here's a cougar. And uh, he experimented with uh, trap, uh, trip line photography. And uh, this is a picture that he got. This was in National Geographic. And when it appeared, I believe this was in the 20s. I mean, this was, this was big, this was eye catching, you know. So let's move along. And there's just another camera he used uh, shows, <laughs> shows how uh, things change with years. Let's move on. That was his camera. Uh, he was very, uh, he was a member, one of the founding members of the Florida Audubon Society. He spent, you know, part of every year down here for, for a long time, 40 years. He may have missed a few winters. I, I'm not sure. But, uh, you know, he, he lived uh, for, Oh gosh, more than 20 years uh, in the winter in Gainesville. Uh, his wife uh, and he spent about a dozen years uh, in the 20s in Ormond Beach at the Coquina Hotel. Uh, that's where he golfed with John D. Rockefeller and got a million dollars donated. Uh, I don't know if he lost it in a golf match, but anyway, Rockefeller ended up uh, writing a check for the museum for a million bucks. And, uh, you know, back in, uh, 1923 that was a lot of money and uh but uh he helped hire guy bradley who is our martyr game warden here he was an audubon warden and uh he met by accident they encountered each other down in the keys and he wrote a very poignant recollection that he met him and that uh, warden was 32 a family man and he talked about being shot at all the time by the plume hunters. And, uh, but he was determined to protect the birds. He had been a reformed poacher, reformed plume hunter, uh, who was sickened at the slaughter. And uh, Chapman wrote, he said, uh, I felt like I was talking to a dead man. And a few months later, he was murdered uh, down in Flamingo, Florida. And the murderer got off. But that's a whole story in itself. You'll have to read the book, the rest of that. Next one. Theodore Roosevelt was a close personal friend. He and Chapman, Chapman would visit him in the White House and they would end up going outside on the White House ground, uh, running around uh, trying to spot and identify birds uh, competing against one another like boys. Also, he was visiting him at the Sagamore Hill state on Long Island. Uh, they were uh, kindred spirits. Uh, many people don't realize that, uh, that Teddy Roosevelt uh, was a bird lover. He wanted to be a naturalist when he was at Harvard in the 1880s. And he became a self-taught naturalist who was respected by those that made it a living. Uh, Chapman said one time, he said, Teddy Roosevelt knows more about birds than I do. Quite a compliment. Now, next slide. Uh, again, when you read Chapman's life, he knew everybody. It was a uh, tight-knit group of pioneers. And C. Hart Merriman was a good friend. And uh, that was a challenge of writing his life because you try to introduce these other people and their own lives were so uh, significant. It was, you know, you go off on a tangent and uh, start writing their biography. But they were good friends all their lives. Seahart Merriman, uh, as you remember, he, uh, he ran the biological survey. He was a young man. He was actually a medical doctor. But in the 1880s, the Department of Agriculture created this biological survey. And this was the forerunner of what today we call the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. This is a great guy, great friends. Let's move right along. Next slide. Paul uh, Krogel, he was an uneducated German immigrant who uh, 
who moved to uh, the Indian River Lagoon as a teenager, and uh, he started protecting the pelicans on his own. And he would, uh, his farm was right near Pelican Island, and he would uh, go out there in his rowboat with his 10 gauge shotgun across his lap and uh, make sure that nobody just came and uh, shot up the rooker. Uh, later, he was hired as the Audubon warden, and he worked very closely with uh, Chapman. And he was another self taught naturalist and uh, greatly respected by Chapman. Paul Krogel is a uh, great figure in Florida's conservation history. Let's move right along. Uh, Fuertes, Luis Aguez Fuertes of Cornell University was and is regarded as perhaps Audubon's successor as a bird artist, bird portraitist. He was a close friend of Chapman, he took him under his wing and uh, they were like brothers. And uh, sadly, uh, Fuertes was visiting the Chapmans in Upper New York State after returning from Africa, where he uh, did some marvelous pictures of African birds. Brought the birds pictures to show Chapman, and on the way back after a weekend, he was driving back to Cornell, and they came up to a railroad crossing, and there was a hay wagon there, and obscured his view, and he wasn't familiar, I guess, with the road. But anyway, he tried to cross the, the railroad crossing and a locomotive crashed into his car, killed him instantly at age 54 and badly injured his wife. The paintings flew out of the car. Not one was damaged, but it was a terrible blow to many people. He was beloved. Uh, he, uh, he was uh, nicknamed Forts by Chapman. Chapman nicknamed his friends. By the way, I told you about the trip down the Swanee with Brewster and Chapman. After that trip, they referred to each other in correspondence by their nicknames. Chapman was the fiend and, and Brewster was Sahib. No one knows exactly why they picked those nicknames, but they were. But uh, Fuertes was Fuertes. He was quite a lovable character. Let's, let's move along. Uh, dioramas. He didn't invent the diorama, but he perfected the bird habitat diorama. Uh, and uh, it was, the reason that his stood out is they always had a conservation message. He picked uh, species that were threatened. These are black skimmers. And he would go to the site an actual site, they would take the birds at that site, they would take nest materials, they would take uh, sand, dirt, they would photograph the area. Uh, and he always, he always brought a painter. He worked with many painters uh, to paint a background. And he uh, devised a curved background to give you a depth of field. Fortis was his favorite for these dioramas. You still can see many of these dioramas at the American Museum, and they're quite, quite eye-catching, that's for sure. Okay, moving right along. Uh, here's a diorama of the flamingos. Uh, I could talk for 20 minutes about his trip to the Bahamas, uh, where he was the first to penetrate an active flamingo city, a rookery. 2,000 birds. The adults flew off to gather food in the morning. He moved into the center of the rookery, set up his blind with his cameras, and they came back, and he was literally, could, if he wanted, he could reach out and touch the nestling. And he took some pictures that appeared in a prominent magazine of the day, Century Magazine, and it was a phenomenon. And then also, they created this diorama. And this was 1905. So another achievement. Let's move on. Uh, going back to Fuertes, uh, I, some of you may be familiar with this species, which is no longer uh, no longer residing in Florida. It was a Carolina parakeet, and this is by Fuertes. By the way, uh, growing up, uh, Chapman, <laughs> he. I can see why my friend wondered about why this guy loved birds. 
The first time he saw the uh, endangered passenger pigeon, he uh, shot two of them out of a flock and ate them. Uh, he, he also, uh, the ivory-billed woodpecker and the, uh, the parakeet here were, were about to leave the scene. And in both cases, he killed, he killed them. His thinking being that uh, the species was doomed and what needed to be done was to uh, secure specimens for the museum, whether it was right or wrong. That's the way he, he uh, thought at the time. Moving right along. This is a close up of the diorama he did on the Cuthbert Rookery. And uh, as, as you remember, that was uh, one of the last holdouts. And you can see a roseate uh, spoonbill up at the top. And that gives you uh, an idea of the realism and yet the artistic value of the diorama. This is just a small portion of the diorama. They're usually, oh, 10 feet by eight feet, if I recall. Next slide, please. This is a book that started it all for me, Camps and Cruises of an Ornithologist. Teddy Roosevelt encouraged him to write this book. Please. If you're interested in Chapman, read this. This is a compilation of all his great adventures uh, in Texas. And I didn't even tell you about the hurricane in, uh, in the Bahamas where he was almost killed. Great book. Uh, many were originally magazine articles that he wrote. Okay, next slide. Bird Lore, his magazine. Next slide. So many people were formed by or inspired by Chapman. Alexander Wetmore here at age 14. Note he has a copy of Bird Lore. His article had just appeared and he later became uh, a noted expert. Uh, he was secretary of the Smithsonian. In his later years, he wrote a book, Birds of, the, of Panama, which for many years was regarded as a definitive work. I don't know if it still is. Just of many, many people who began as acolytes of, of Chapman. One of them was, uh, was Roger Tor Tory Peterson, for instance. But let's go on. Ah, the Columbian Expedition down wood burning steamboats. All oh, great stories. Again, we're, we're going too long. I know that. You'll have to read the book, folks. You want to know about those adventures. Let's move on. Uh, there he is in Columbia again. Uh, you know, and it's interesting. Here he is on a field expedition. He's on a, I think that's a mule. And you notice he has a tie on, which goes to show you that uh, a gentleman was a gentleman, even in the, even in the jungle. Moving right along. Next slide. Ah, his favorite field, uh, field guy, Ch Cherry, George K. Cherry. He was somebody right out of a novel. He was uh, a bird collector for the great museums of the world. Uh, he was a rough character. Uh, he was so valuable because uh, he knew birds. He knew uh, he had the, the woodcraft. He knew how to pack a mule. He knew how to use a gun. He was involved in several uh, encounters with bandits and he killed them. In fact, he had to paddle himself 50 miles uh, suffering from a shotgun wound. Uh, a brigand almost uh, killed him. He wrote a book called Dark Trails in 1931. It is quite an entertaining book. What a life he led. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt Chapman recommended Cherry to accompany Theodore Roosevelt on his exploration of the River of Doubt after he uh, left the presidency in Brazil, which was a terrible ordeal. Roosevelt credited his survival in large part to, to Cherry. Great, great uh, character. Moving on. There they are at a Posada uh, during one of, the, uh, one of his expeditions. To the left, the balding man is Fuertes, the artist. The others uh, are supporting characters. To the right, you can see uh, Chapman's a little portly there. This was 1913. Moving on to the next one, 
same expedition. He looks sick there. Uh, he suffered from re relapsing fever. He lost his eyesight. He returned home blind or nearly blind, and they were very worried uh, what if he would recover or not. Uh, didn't prevent him from going back to South America, though. Nothing, nothing would stop him in his search for, for, for new birds. Okay, next, next slide. Another beautiful dia diorama. Let's go next. Oh, Chap, oh, he came back, George K. Sherry. Well, moving right along. George is a camera hog. There's Panama. Moving, next slide, please. There he is at Panama using some 24 power binoculars. And as you see, they're secured on a tripod. Uh, boy, those would be nice to use. Uh, next one, please. There he is in his lighter years. I think this was 1939. I'm not sure. I think it might be his home in Coconut Grove. At the end, uh, he had left New Jersey uh, as a middle-aged man, and he had an apartment on Fifth Avenue near Central Park. Uh, and then he lived uh, in Coconut Grove. They had a nice cottage. His neighbor was Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, by the way. So ooh, next slide. And there he is with, I was going to tell you, each of these people, each was a giant in their own right. Uh, he led the, the Department of Ornithology from 1920 to 1942. It was a golden era. And each of these people is worthy of a biography. We're going to have to move on. And here's his gravestone in Bergen County, right there where he, as a boy, fell in love with birds. He taught men to know birds, children to love them. And I apologize for going on so long. Uh, that's it, folks. That's all. Well, thank you so much um, for that amazing presentation. If you have any questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat, and I will be able to ask them um, for you. Or you can raise your hand, and I can call on you, and you can uh, unmute yourself. Um, are there any questions at this time? Oh, we got one coming through. Let's see. Um, Tammy says, Chapman was such a good writer. Do you have a favorite book, article, or letter of his to recommend? That's a difficult question. He, uh, It's like uh, I have uh, an old friend, uh, wife of a former boss. She had 11 children. And she says, you know, people ask, well, who's your favorite? She says, how can I say who's my favorite? Uh, some of the books are more dated than others, but again, I go back, if you're going to read Chapman, uh, I would suggest that you read one of the three books. The one that I mentioned, Camps and Cruises of an Ornithologist, that beautiful red flamingo, by the way, was painted by Fuertes, uh, Louis A. Fuertes, his great friend, uh, Acolyte. Uh, these are full, a lot, most of them are magazine articles. Uh, and uh, it takes you through all his adventures, uh, the hurricane, the tornado, the Cuba, oh, all of it. That'd be a good one. Other two books, 1929, he uh, wrote his recollections of his Panamanian, uh, and that was uh, called uh, My Tropical Air, like, uh, Air Castle. Then in 1938, his last book, which is a bestseller, also based on Panama, was called Adventures, My Life in the Tropical Air Castle. Very easy to confuse. Very well written. Uh, many magazine articles. You know, go online, you can find them. He just was a superb communicator. And that's really his greatest legacy, is he inspired people and educated people and was a wonderful lobbyist for the cause. He was the voice of conservation. Thank you for the question. Definitely. Yeah, de lots of comments coming in saying no apologies necessary and that it was a fantastic presentation. Um, Don oh, Torino commented, he, he's actually from Bergen Audubon. Uh, and he thanks you for the presentation. There's a great connection. Oh, Don, uh, Don is there? Indeed. Oh, let, me let me tell you about Don Torino. He's a great writer in his own right. 
and a very knowledgeable man. Uh, I'll be speaking to Bergen County, New Jersey, Audubon, thanks to Don. And he's written a, a wonderful little book on, uh, on uh, the meadow, meadowlands where he, he discovered his, uh, his love of birds. Don, uh, tell me again that title. I read it and I, uh, but my old timer's disease is hurting me. What was the title of your book? <coughs> uh, can, can you hear me? Um, yep. Yeah, um, it's, uh, it's called uh, Life in the Meadowlands. And Life in the Meadowlands, correct. Yeah. It's a very good book, Don. And Don is, I wish that Don and, and Re, uh, Rex, uh, uh, not Rex, oh God, I'm getting so mixed up. <laughs> anyway, he is an authority on Chapman. He knows things about Chapman I don't know. And uh, I hope someday I get to meet him. But, uh, Don is, is quite a bird man. Yes, I, I I can't thank you enough. I could have listened to you all night. I, I really do appreciate it. And, you know, we have that great connection between Bergen County and and and, and, and your chapter down there. And, you know, um, you know, anybody that that photographs birds, that watches birds, that does a Christmas bird count, that does anything, walks in the steps of, of Chapman. And, uh, you know, and uh, that's why we made our, our, our Chapman birding trail here. And, uh, you know, he's a local hero to us. And, uh, you know, and we, we certainly want to keep his memory alive. And uh, we certainly thank you for doing that. Oh, well, thanks to you, Don, and you. You know, uh, Chapman casts a long shadow. Uh, if I accomplish anything through this book, I hope that it's an introduction to a new generation that can really appreciate what he did. But not only that, you know, Chapman, Chapman speaks to why we love birds. And he speaks to uh, things that most modern writers don't uh, speak about. Of course, a lot of uh, modern bird writers are very technical, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, Chapman could be technical. He wrote more than 200 uh, articles for professional journals. But he was, I like to say, bilingual. He could speak to the regular folks out there in a way that uh, reminded them of why it is that they like to get up at some ungodly hour and go traipsing into a marsh to look for a bird. You know, I, I agree. He, you know, your book actually um, brought that home to me and uh, reminded me of what uh, we need to continue to do. Uh, the way he brought the love of birds to the average person, uh, the love of birds to even non-birders. Um, I think that's what we need to do more of. Well, you know, there's no measuring how many thousands, tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of people that he uh, converted to uh, bird lovers, to conservationists. Uh, in my case, although I always loved uh, nature, uh, I was not particularly a, a bird guy until about 20 years ago when I discovered uh, Chapman. And uh, so he recruited me from the grave. You know, he'd been dead for several, five years, but, but he got another one. And we need that. We, we need that. We've got to get people interested and uh, absolutely thank you I'll talk to you soon i'll talk to you soon too thanks for coming don i appreciate it pleasure all righty well thank you so much jim for that amazing presentation and thank you rex for the introduction and thank you everyone for coming and listening our next evening program is on january 14th regarding um wintering sparrow identification and where to find them in the in alachua county so i hope you tune in for that as well Thanks again, Jim. I hope Thank you have you. and everyone have a great night. Thank you to everyone.